Amen and amen. Well, I feel the presence of the Lord here this morning, don't you? Hallelujah. Give him praise. Praise God. Remain standing, please, in reverence to the word and turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Nehemiah. Chapter 4 and verse 20. <clears throat> I just want to read one verse this morning. Nehemiah 4 and 20. Nehemiah said to the people, Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, Rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. I want to preach this morning. This is a rallying point. This is a rallying point. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and you may be seated. <clears throat> there were times in Scripture, in the Old Testament, when God so ordered things that they would use the sounding of the trumpet to direct people. Sometimes it was the shofar, the ram's horn that you see us use once in a while in worship and we'll probably bring it out here in a, in a moment. Sometimes it was the shofar, sometimes the ram's horn, sometimes according to Numbers 10, they had two silver trumpets. God instructed them to have in place when they were, when the children of Israel were in their 40 years of wilderness wanderings. And just as we would be familiar with, especially in the military today, perhaps the bugle, the sounding of the call, that certain sounds meant certain things. In fact, even in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul alludes to it and talks about the trumpet giving a certain sound so that people know what to do. In, in the military, there's a sound of reveille. Many times I've stood on cemeteries when they would give military rights and military honors and they play the taps and nothing is sadder than that sound because we know what it means and what goes with that, and there were certain sounds connected with certain meanings. When they would sound the two silver trumpets, according to Numbers 10, basically, it was for one of four things that they wanted the people to do, because you'd, in those days, you didn't have a public address system, and there were at least probably about some three million Israelites in the wilderness, so they would use the sounding of the trumpet. And the trumpet usually typically meant at least one of four things. Number one, it was a sound to assemble that they wanted the people to gather together. Or number two, it was a sound of movement that they were getting ready to move out. They followed the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And so for movement, they would sound the trumpet. I mean, if you know, you didn't want to get left behind in the wilderness. You wanted to go with everybody else. You wanted to hear the sound of the trumpet. So it was a sound to assemble. It was a sound of movement. It was a sound of war. That when they were going to war, that they would sound the trumpet. And it was a sound of worship. That when they would call together the people to worship, that they expected people to respond. And can I tell you this morning, in fact, of course you know, one of these days the Bible said again, there's going to be a trumpet sound. 
It's not a fairy tale. First Thessalonians, for our ears are still supposed to be tuned to the sound of the trumpet. First Thessalonians 4 said, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord, with the saints to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with with these words, we're still listening for the sound of the trumpet. And how many of you know, please do not miss that the trumpet is a wind instrument. The trumpet is a wind instrument. The wind being one of the primary symbols of the Holy Spirit. And there are still times spiritually when the Holy Spirit will sound a call. I want you to move here. I want you to respond here. We're not supposed to just run off doing our own thing and doing whatever we want to do. But spiritually, we are to be attuned to the Spirit so that when our ear hears the sounding of the trumpet, we move in the direction I don't want to miss it when God is calling me to move. In fact, I've been stricken. Come on up here and just stand with me for a minute, Dwight. I've been stricken here recently. God will quicken, the Spirit of the Lord will quicken certain verses to you at certain times. And in Isaiah chapter 50, verses four and five, it even talks about how God will awaken my ear. How many of you know two times we are, are deaf and dull, we hear so much of the roar of the world around us. We're always on a device even when we're with somebody. We're not with somebody. We're with someone else. And we've gotten so dull in our hearing that so many times there's a reason that Samuel was taught as a young boy. Eli was half backslid himself, but he recognized the Spirit of God was doing something. And when the voice of the Lord would call, he said, son, said Samuel, the next time he speaks, say, speak Lord for your servant heareth amen and Isaiah 50 talked about God awakening my ear God, help me to hear the call. Help me not to miss. Can I tell you, we're not living in ordinary times. I believe God wants to do something in the midst of his people. We need to be attuned, whether it's in the church, in the earth. Sometimes it's just in your family. Sometimes it's just over your kids. Sometimes it's over your marriage that God says, I'm sounding the trumpet. You better give attention to this. You better get up and respond to the call. This is the time. We should pray for him to awaken our ear. Too many times we're stone deaf. Hello. I never will forget with our older daughter a few years back in that summer she was headed to middle school and it just amazes me and frankly scares me what our kids have to confront in middle school. It's not enough just to show up for a couple hours like you're doing God some favor on Sunday morning. Your kids better know God is the most important thing in your life. And Emily was headed to middle school and Jennifer and I were constrained by the Holy Spirit for weeks. She better have an encounter with God before she hits middle school because she's gonna need it. That was the sound of the trumpet and that summer our, some people in our church and our youth group took, took her with them to the ramp and Emily had an encounter with God that she will tell you. She picked her up, God picked her up and set her down and she's never been the same until this day. When you hear the trumpet sound, you better get up and do something with it. And you come to this text in Nehemiah's day, they'd been carried off. The, the, the city had been pillaged because of their idolatry, the judgment of God, but God was restoring his people. And Nehemiah had led them back and they were the city was piles of rubble like the spiritual condition that we find ourselves in now. I said the city was piles of rubble and they were beginning to rebuild the walls and it was dangerous. And sometimes they were spread out. And, and each, everybody was assigned a section. And they had enemies. Because the devil never is going to like it when God starts rebuilding some things in your life. And Nehemiah developed a system 
They were already familiar with the trumpet. And he said, listen, this is the text we read. He said, wherever the trumpet sounded, if you hear the trumpet sound, because when they were building the wall, they'd build with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. Because they were trying to rebuild, but they knew they may have to fight. And he said, wherever you hear the trumpet sounded, you respond there. You go there. You respond. You get up. Quit making excuses. Drop whatever you're doing. Quit acting like what you've got on your agenda is more important. And get up and go to where the trumpet sounded. Hallelujah. I'll get to you. Just hang on a second. <clears throat> In fact, at one point, they would rebuild the wall and later on, God would, people kind of, some of the refugees kind of came back in waves to Jerusalem. And in the book of Haggai, God spoke in Haggai 1 and said, listen, spoke to his people. He said, listen, it's time to rebuild the temple, but you, you build in your own house. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. He said, you're building paneled houses for yourself and it's time to rebuild the temple of God. You know what he was saying? He was saying, listen, I'm sounding the trumpet. The trumpet of the Spirit. It's not time to be off doing your own thing. Consume. We've come to a day, even in church, we convince ourselves we're pretty good people, but we've spent all week doing everything else, never giving God a thought with our own agenda, and then wonder why we don't have the presence of God and the temple still lies in ruins. The trumpet's being sounded. It's time to get up and move to the call of God. But they're trying to rebuild the wall and Nehemiah said, wherever you hear it sounded, you get up and go there. Listen, when I was 14 years old, I heard, I heard the trumpet sound. I had an encounter with God. God called me to preach. God laid his hand on my life. That was when I was 14. When I was 16, I went to preach my first revival. I will never forget it. I can take you to the place. I had an encounter with the living God. I heard the trumpet sound. When the trumpet sounded, it's not time to sit. It's not time to just be preoccupied with your stuff. It's time to seek first the Lord to get up and go where he calls. And Nehemiah said, wherever you hear the trumpet sounded, he said, you rally to that point. You rally to that point. Now, the word rally, they're going to put the definition up on the screen, and I, I, I love this. If you'll look at the screens, the word rally means to bring into order again. Ball teams do it and armies do it. To bring into order again, to gather and organize or inspire anew, to draw or call persons together for a common action or effort, and it means to concentrate or revive as one strength, spirits, etc. In other words, you've been sick, but you rally back. Maybe they didn't think you were going to make it, but you rally back and you regather strength. Can I tell you, we're in a time when as never before, it's not by mind and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith God. We've built our buildings. We've tried our programs. We've preached our sermons, but the spirit is sounding the trumpet. It's time for his people to get up and get serious about it. And he said, wherever you hear the trumpet sounded, you rally there. Amen. I believe it's time to rally. I said, I believe it's time to rally. A few weeks ago, will you get that word ready, please? A couple of weeks ago, and I shared this with our discipleship class. We have youth and kids through the buildings on Wednesday night. But we prayed over this here in the adult class in the sanctuary Wednesday night. There was a word that came forth in our church, a prophetic word. And this is what God said to us. He said, realize the urgency in, the, in this message. And I'm not, I'm not letting go of this. He said, realize the urgency in this message. Realize the urgency in my voice as I speak. 
I say to you on a daily basis, there are those around you bleeding, dying, and hurting. They've lost all hope. They can't see the light for the darkness that surrounds them. I say, see the urgency, feel the urgency. I'm calling you to respond to their need. As you begin to forget about yourself and respond to those that are hurting around you, bring them to this place. Bring them to this place because if you'll bring them here, I'll touch them. I'll heal them. I'll give them hope where they've been hopeless. I'll give them life where they're dead. But I've called you to those that are around you, to those you see every single day. I call you to respond to their needs. If you'll respond to those I put in your path, this house will be full of people that are hurting and dying, but they will find me. This house will be full of people that know what it is to come back from the edge of death. But I'm putting it in your field. I'm putting it in your hands because even now you can see those around you. I'm calling you to bring to this place. But when they come to this place, this house is ready. This house is prepared and ready and they will find what they need, saith the Lord. What is that? That's the trumpet. (laughs) Sound that. That's the sounding of the trumpet. God calls his people to respond to that. Give the Lord praise. Holy Ghost listen to me I know that never supersedes scripture but we believe in the prophetic word God said if you'll get them here you're ready and if you'll get them here I'll touch them and fill this house And God, God knows my heart. It's not about the numbers we have. It's not about any of that. God has given me grace to get past some of that. It's about people. Listen, we're after the outcast, the drug addict who's so stoned that he doesn't know his name. The homosexual that has gone looking in all the wrong places. The sexually promiscuous who has slept around and tried everything, the people who are outcast and don't even want to come to church because they don't feel like they'd be accepted there and nobody wants them. That's who we're after, the people that nobody else wants. And I'm telling you, I feel like the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me this week. And he said, listen, in this time and this place, this is a rallying point. I said, this is a rallying point. When the trumpet sounded, you quit doing everything else that you think is more important and you get up and you get with the program of God. When we're going to the jails, when we're going to the nursing homes, when we're doing all the stuff that we're starting to do, you get up and you move with the call. Somebody praise the name of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Stay handy, Dwight. I may want that again. It is vitally important that when God calls, we don't miss that. I don't always understand the ways of God. Sometimes he moves in cycles and seasons. There are some of you, names and faces, specific people, 
I try to pray for you on a regular basis. But the last few weeks, there have been some of you in the middle of the night that God wakes me up with your face and your name rolling and echoing in my spirit. Get up and pray for them. Get up and pray for them. What do you do when the trumpet calls? You drop what you're doing and you move with the call. This is a rallying point. Maybe God is calling you to pray and fast. Maybe God is calling you to deny your flesh. Maybe God is calling you to seek him in new ways. See, we've come to a time when we really, we have adopted, we listen to the world more than we do the word. And we have lost, we've adopted some Americanized version of the gospel that is not the real gospel. And we have so made it so individualistic we don't even understand why the church matters anymore. We think it's nice to go to church, but just because you're a nice person, but we don't understand why the church matters anymore. Or when God calls us to a rallying point to come together, listen, the church, along with things like Bible reading and prayer, we, it's not just a guilt trip that we want you to come to church. He said we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But it's not just a guilt trip. Along with Bible reading and prayer and some of those basics, the church is one of the primary means by which God dispenses his grace in our lives. That's why you need to be here. I'm afraid to miss. I might miss something. And I'm the preacher, hallelujah. I don't know what's always what's gonna happen. When the, when the, it's not just going through the motions, it's responding to the call of the trumpet. I said the church is one of the primary means by which God dispenses his grace. I told you, baby, I'm more churchy than Noah was archy. When the doors are open, I want to be there. From the time I was a kid, my mom will tell you, we'd be driving down the road, every big building I saw, I said, is that a church? Is that a church? That's the only thing I knew. I've always believed in church. It's something inbred in me. I may not have understood it as a kid, but the, you still know when the trumpet's being sounded. <clears throat> you remember, you remember in the New Testament in Ephesians 6 when Paul is calling us to put on the whole armor of God. And he goes through the pieces of armor, the helmet of salvation and all that stuff. And he says, take up the shield of faith so that with it you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You remember that? How many of you know the devil will turn loose those fiery darts sometimes? Amen? But we've not always understood the purpose of that. Generally, when they used fiery darts in warfare, I need about half a dozen men real quick. Thank you. Hallelujah. Just Everybody just line up. Just leave me in the middle and line up across here, facing that way. When they would shoot in, in warfare, when they would shoot fiery, get in close here, guys. When they would shoot, hallelujah. Glory to God. When they'd shoot fiery darts, really the intent was not just to hit me or to hit an individual. They would shoot, usually, it wasn't to take out a particular man. Usually when they would shoot those flaming arrows, they would aim them at the supply tents. So that if they, it, what, it, what the flaming arrows really were was a tool of distraction. So that if they set the supply tents on fire, they thought we'd get distracted, all our supplies and our, 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 all our stuff is burning up. And they thought if they'd set the supply tents on fire, we'd break ranks and run 
to take care of our stuff that was being burned up and then they could beat us not just because they hit us but because they got us distracted to run to take care of other stuff. They thought we'd break ranks and run but when they start shooting the fiery arrows you just still keep fighting and you stay close and you hear you hear the call of the Holy Spirit. You know what happens? Some of you get discouraged, have trouble at the house, have trouble on the job, and want to sit at the house and feel sorry for yourself. When you don't feel like Cummins, when you need to be here more than any other time, he's trying to get you to break ranks and run. But if you'll stay in the house of God with those God has lined you up with, get where the trumpet's being sounded. So we don't understand that. We act like, well, you want me to go to church just because the preacher puts a guilt trip on me. Hello. Some of you are looking half convicted. I'm not trying to fuss at you. I'm trying to tell you what will help you. That when the devil has set your goods on fire and lit them up, that's not the time to quit then. That's the time to get where the trumpet's being sounded, right in the middle of God's people. Jimmy, you don't mind me testifying for you a minute, do you? God's brought this guy in the last few months. He'd been in some places he'd just rather not tell you about, hadn't you, Jimmy? But he came to this church, and people loved him, and God got a hold of his life. And he's told, Jimmy's told me, Pastor, anything going on, if they're working on something around, anything happening, I want to be there because that's a better place for me to be because he'd spent enough years with the devil setting everything else in his life on fire, but he discovered when he could get to the house of God where the trumpet was being sounded, there was safety in that. That was the place of protection, and it was the key to his victory. You've done it yourself long enough. We've bought into this Americanized gospel that it's just me and Jesus got our own thing going. I'm telling you, this is something we, we do together. I need these men, and they need me, and we need you. devil keep you out, isolate you, separate you, and that's as good as the devil wants. That's exactly what he was trying to get you to get to what he was trying to accomplish in your life. He was trying to distract you to get you to break ranks and run. There's some of you, listen, we do this together. We're serious when we talk about reaching the outcasts and the people nobody else wants. There are some, and some of you have de developed relationship with some of these guys up here and, and some of you gotten saved, God brought you out of some stuff and the reason you're still here is because I made you meet me for lunch once a week. And if you're gonna sin, you had to look me in the eye to do it or lie about it. Hello. You say, well, shouldn't they have fear of God instead of fear of the pastor? Yeah, ideally they should and ultimately they will. But if fear of the pastor will keep them until fear of God kicks in, then that's all right if it'll keep you living right and on your way to heaven and missing hell. I get to feeling good, don't know where I want to go. So we've not understood that our life and death depends on some of that. There's some stuff I wouldn't have made it through if it hadn't been for the church. I thank God for Jesus, but I thank God he loved me through the arms of some other people sometimes and encouraged me on the way. And I wouldn't have made it this far if there hadn't been some others alongside of me. 
Let me give you, let me give you one more example. I, you know, I grew up in the mountains. I don't claim to know much about the ocean and that kind of thing, but they tell me that there's this thing in the ocean called a, a barnacle. Now, a barnacle starts out I'm just leaving you up here because you look so good. A barnacle starts out as a tiny, free-floating organism. But before long, a barnacle will attach itself to a, to a hard surface, maybe a rock or even the side of a boat. And that when a barnacle... How many of you know the church has been, we're talking about boats, the church has been often referred to as the old ship of Zion. A ship, a boat is often a picture of the church. And you need a barnacle anointing. We get our feelings hurt. Somebody does something we don't like. Somebody didn't speak to us. We didn't, we didn't show ourselves friendly, but dear God, they didn't speak to us. You know? And we, we run off, run somewhere else. I went to, well, they did, they did something I didn't like. Well, my blessed God, I'm the pastor and they do stuff I don't like. Doesn't mean I leave. But a barnacle will attach itself to the hull and it will secrete this rubbery substance that will harden and it'll grow and it'll secrete some more of that and it'll grow and it'll secrete so in concentric rings it keeps secreting this substance, this rubbery substance and it hardens until after a while it gets like cement. I mean, you can't blast it off there. You can't get it off because it has attached itself. And if we're going to see God do something, we've run everywhere, here, there, and yon, all over the place long enough. If we're going to see God do something, we got to have some people with the spirit and the anointing of a barnacle who will attach themselves to the hull of the ship, attach themselves to the church, to the old ship of Zion, and say, baby, you can't blast me out of here. You can speak to me or not speak to me, but God put me here and I'm not going anywhere. Because I got news for you. That's why we don't grow up, because we always run instead of stay and work through it. Help me, Jesus. When I first came to be your pastor, some of you liked me and some of you didn't. And I got news for you. I like some of you and some of you I didn't. I may, I, maybe I'm being just a little facetious. Most of you I liked. But there's a few, we, we may have had a difference or two, but you're still here and I'm still here and we learned to work through it. And we grew up through it and we learned to appreciate each other. And God blessed and increased his anointing as a result of it. And that's what God intends to happen. There may be times that you get mad at me or I get mad at you. But I'm not your pastor till I do something you don't like. And you choose whether you're going to stay or not. That's the way this thing works. But when we stay and we have the anointing of a barnacle, you, I ain't going anywhere. We're going to grow through this thing. I'm going to secrete some more stuff. I'm just locking in. I'm not going anywhere. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. There are a lot of times fiery darts come. Fiery arrows come. 
And the devil's doing his best to distract us, to get us to break, break ranks and run. But when we stay together and we just lock in and keep marching forward and keep fighting, God told Paul, I'm almost done. God told the apostle Paul one place that God sent him to. And, and this was really before the work was even done. And I can show you in the text, there were whole, everybody in that region heard the gospel. Everybody didn't get saved, but everybody heard the gospel and the great commission was fulfilled, which is what God intends to happen. God spoke to him really before anything even happened. We got there earlier on and said, Paul, I have many people in this city. That's why I sent you here. I have many people. Can I tell you something? In Corbin, in the Tri-County, right here in southeast, south central Kentucky, they may not know it yet. They may be hung over this morning with their head in the toilet from last night. They may not have a clue yet but they belong to him and they belong to this house. I said they belong to this house. God already ordained them here. He's sounding the trumpet. I said he's sounding the trumpet. He's sounding the trumpet. I have never, I've never preached this before. But I'm telling you, at this time and place, maybe God's doing it in some spots in your life, but at this time and place, wherever we hear the trumpet sounded, we better rally there. Head up, Okoshaya. You mind if I testify for you a minute, Steve? He'd been around church for years. But he came here two or three, a few years ago really getting locked in. God got a hold of him doing some things. He'd been around church for years, but doing some things in a deeper way than he'd ever known in all his life. And you've been around church for years, but it was just a few years ago that the Holy Ghost got to work. It wasn't anything I did. Nobody pressured you. The Holy Ghost got to working on Steve. And that barnacle spirit started kicking in. He said, Pastor, I never have joined. I want to join the church. This is where God wants me to be. I want to be right in the middle of what God's doing. And I can't afford to miss it. You know how some of you are finally going to see your loved ones turned around that you thought were so backslidden, so drug addicted and alcohol infested. There was never any hope. You know how they're going to change. They're going to change when you get a barnacle spirit on you and lock in and something happens. Stand with me.